In this online lecture, we're going to talk about the last type of substituent here, and that is the meta-directing deactivators. And we're going to be doing the same analysis that we did on the first two to understand how and why these substituents behave the way they do. But first, let's look at the substituents that fall into this category. Here are some of them, not all, but some of the most important ones. I'll give you the full list a little bit later. Notice the first two substituents. They both have carbonyl groups. Remember, that's a C double bonded to an O. That's one thing to look for when you're trying to figure out a substituent. If it has a carbonyl group, most likely it's going to be a meta-directing deactivator. But let's dive into the analysis here to see why he behaves the way he does. Which means, remember, we have to think about the inductive and the resonance effect and figure out the overall effect. To do that, let me first draw a possible resonance structure. Remember, one move I can make here is take these pi electrons and have them jump up on the oxygen. The result of this move would look like this right here. Notice this places a positive charge on the carbon directly connected to the benzene ring. This helps us understand the inductive effect. Think about it, because that carbon is positively charged, it means it attracts electrons. So through the sigma bond between that carbon and the benzene ring, we expect the electrons in the bond to be attracted to that positive charge and want to move outward and away from the benzene ring. So that means that this substituent has a withdrawing inductive effect. So again, let's put that to the side here and now let's investigate the resonance effect. Well, watch this resonance move that I make here. I can say that these pi electrons right here could jump this way, which means the resulting resonance structure of both this move and the earlier resonance move that I made together make this resulting resonance structure. That now places a pi bond between the substituent and the benzene ring. And remember, look at which way those arrows and those electrons are going. They're overall pointing away from the ring and towards the substituent which means this substituent has a withdrawing resonance effect. We've never seen this case before, where both the inductive and the resonance effect are withdrawing. So for this type of substituent, it doesn't matter which effect is more powerful, they're both pointing away from the ring. So the overall direction of electron flow for this substituent is outward, away from the ring. So this substituent is overall electron withdrawing. Or remember, in other words, we would call him an EWG, an electron withdrawing group. And remember, we learned in the previous online lecture that if a substituent on a benzene ring is overall electron withdrawing, then it is a deactivating substituent. So that's exactly what we have here. So that explains why these substituents are deactivators. And remember, this means it doesn't make the benzene ring not reactive, just simply less reactive compared to just pure benzene. Now, the other truth about this substituent, remember, is that it's meta-directing. And remember, what does that mean? Well, as an example here, remember, if we had this molecule right here, and we wanted to predict the product of this reaction, we would know that Br2 FeBr3 adds a Br to the benzene ring, but since this molecule already has a substituent on it, we would have to ask ourselves, what kind of substituent is that? And we would have memorized that he's a meta-directing deactivator, which means the BR would land meta to him. Remember, that's what meta-directing means in the title. But remember, we should also do an analysis to understand why it's meta-directing which if you remember how the analysis works, we add electrophiles ortho, para, and meta and see what kind of intermediates we get and see what is the more stable, more likely pathway. So to do that, the first thing I want to do is draw that resonance structure that shows the electrons jumping up on that oxygen, giving us this resulting resonance structure. And let's do this. Let's say we're going to add an electrophile ortho to the original substituent. Again, remember the mechanism works this way. We go out and grab the electrophile, and this would be the first intermediate that we would get. And then evaluating the possible resonance structures means that I can move pi electrons this way in order to get this resulting resonance structure. I can do that move again by moving these pi electrons to get this resulting resonance structure. 
And again, I need to emphasize one more time, notice when the electrophile adds ortho, the positive charge of the intermediate lands on the carbon bearing the original substituent. Remember to please watch the online lecture devoted to just that point. So going back to this though, there's something unique about this particular resonance structure. In fact, let's get a better look at it here. Here's what I want you to see. In this case, notice the carbon has a positive charge here, and the positive charge member lands right here on this carbon. And you need to think to yourself, would that be stabilizing or destabilizing? For this particular case, it would be destabilizing. Remember, like charges repel. So having two positive charges right next to each other is going to be high energy, therefore less stable. So in this case, the positive charge landing on the substituent creates a relatively unstable resonance intermediate. Now remember, if you watched the previous two online lectures of this topic, you might remember that if you add an electrophile para to the original substituent, you end up doing this right here, getting this first intermediate. We can draw resonance right here like this to get this corresponding resonance intermediate. And notice right here again, positive charge lands on the carbon bearing the substituent, which means adding para also leads to this relatively unstable resonance intermediate. And just to finish off our analysis here, just in case, remember, you can draw one more resonance structure by moving the electrons this way, you would end up with this result right here. So think about this for a second. So far, it looks like the electrophile would not want to add ortho or para because we land on a relatively unstable intermediate. But remember, we have one more mode of attack here, and that is adding the electrophile meta. And again, remember doing the analysis here involves us grabbing this electrophile, getting this as our first intermediate, and then evaluating the resonance. We say these pi electrons move this way, which ends up with this structure right here. We make that move again by drawing these pi electrons, saying they move up this way. That ends up with this structure right here. And that's about it. These are the only three resonance structures that we would get. And notice what you probably thought was going to happen here. Look where the positive charges end up in all the resonance structures. We should notice what we saw in all the other previous online lectures is that again the positive charge never lands on the carbon bearing the substituent. And in this particular case, for this particular substituent, we don't end up with the relatively unstable resonance intermediate that we got in para and ortho addition. Which means that out of the three choices here, an electrophile is going to choose to add meta to that original substituent. So that is why these guys are called the meta-directing deactivators. And the analysis that I just did here is true for the first four. However, these two substituents right here are still meta-directing deactivators, but they are so for slightly different reasons. Let's do a quick analysis on them. Let's say we have this NH3 plus substituent here. And let's first look at his possible inductive and resonance effects. Well, notice we have a positive charge right here. So that means the inductive effect would be withdrawing. Simply said here, the electrons in that sigma bond would be attracted to the nitrogen because it's positively charged, therefore pulling electrons away from the benzene ring. So he has a withdrawing inductive effect. But what about the resonance effect? Can we draw a resonance structure, say, like this? The answer is, of course, no. There's no electrons on that nitrogen to do this. So you can't draw electrons toward the ring. The only other possibility is maybe to draw electrons away from the ring. So if we try to make this move right here, you should know through resonance that that's not possible. That would create a pi bond between the carbon and the nitrogen and give that nitrogen a total of five bonds. And that nitrogen, remember, cannot handle five bonds. He's one of the atoms that has to obey the octet rule. So that means there's no resonance effect at all for this substituent. And since the only effect is the inductive effect, and it's going outward away from the ring, then his overall effect is withdrawing. And remember, we learned before that if you're a substituent that overall withdraws electrons from a benzene ring, 
you are a deactivator. So that explains that part of this substituent. But why is he meta-directing? Well, at this point, we should be able to do the analysis a little more quicker. And let me show you what I mean by that. Remember, we know that if you add an electrophile, ortho, to the original substituent, that means, remember, one of the resonance structures will have the positive charge on the carbon bearing the substituent. We also know that if you add para to this ring, you'll also get this same resonance structure. And all we have to do now is ask ourselves, in this case, is this stabilizing or destabilizing? Well, of course, remember in this case, it's destabilizing because again, you have the two positive charges who want to repel each other right next to each other. That means this is relatively unstable, which means adding an electrophile ortho or para to the NH3 plus substituent is not going to be favored. So that means he's going to prefer to have the electrophile add meta to him, which means this substituent is a meta-directing deactivator. And right there, what you saw, my evaluation, is just a taste of how I would like you to evaluate a substituent on your orgo test if he's not on your list. Notice how quickly we got to the answer without having to draw all those resonance intermediates. We simply do not have time to do that on an orgo exam. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Remember, I'm leaving that purely for its own lecture. So there it is, our meta-directing deactivators. Now we know them. Now we know why they are the way they are. And since we now discussed all three types of substituents, you're now ready for the overall chart here. This is the relative reactivities of substituents. All these right here, remember, are from group one. They're the ortho pair directing activators. Within that group, this is the reactivity level, with the NH2 being most reactive and the AR and the CH double bond CHR being least reactive within that group. Remember, we also learned about the second group of substituents, the halogens. Remember, these are the ortho pair directing deactivators. But now we know their relative reactivities, and that is the F halogen makes benzene more reactive than the I halogen. And the third group here, remember, are the meta-directing deactivators, which look like this. And again, using this chart, we can tell which ones are more or less reactive within that group. Something I'd like you to note here, notice NO2 is at the bottom of the list. He makes benzene the least reactive out of all these substituents. Now, before you run out and memorize this chart, I would suggest that you do practice problems first because you might find this chart rubs off on you and you won't have to just blindly memorize it. So that completes our discussion here of the three types of substituents with this lecture obviously focusing on the meta-directing deactivators. Now what I'd like to do is let's put this information to work here and let me show you how it's done. Let's say you're on an orgo test and this is the question. They say what is the product of this reaction? Now at first glance this looks kind of complex, but we're going to break it down. What we're going to do is just notice that we have two benzene rings, right? We have this one right here on the left and this benzene ring on the right. And the first thing we need to do to predict product is figure out which ring is more reactive, left hand side or right hand side. Well, if you look at the left hand side of the ring, you would have to imagine that this would be his substituent. And think about it, what category would that entire substituent fit into? Here's what I want you to know. All that matters is what's directly connected to the ring, meaning this is all you would look at, not the rest of the substituent. What kind of substituent is just CH2 by itself? Well, if you remember, that's just an R group. So we're looking at the left-hand ring as having a substituent with an R group. Let's keep this in mind, but let's do the same analysis to the right-hand ring. So we'll remind ourselves the left-hand ring has an R substituent. So now going to this ring right here, now it's as if he has this substituent on him. And again, remember, we only care about what's directly bonded, which is this oxygen. So we would need to see this substituent as an OR substituent. 
So now we could stand back and look at both of these rings and say, well, which one is more reactive? The one with the R substituent or the ring with the OR substituent? Well, that's what this handy chart is for. Notice on this chart, here's where your R group is. He's right here. And the OR, notice, is right here. So according to this chart, the OR makes the benzene ring more reactive. So going back to our sample problem here, it is this ring, the one with the OR, that is going to be more reactive. So that means now we could ignore the left ring and focus on this right-hand ring. And the last thing we need to do here is just to remember, where does OR substituent direct? Well, remember we saw on the list here that he was an orthopair directing activator. So that means if this is the substituent here, we're going to add the electrophile, and in this case, notice we're adding CH3ALCL3, which is technically Fieldcraft's alkylation. That means we're going to add a methyl, and we now know that we would add a methyl either ortho to the substituent, or para to the substituent, or maybe both. But let's say you're on your orgo test and you could only pick one answer. Would we get the ortho or the para? Well, think about it. Our original substituent is very large. So that means putting the methyl ortho would give us a higher steric issue. Whereas putting the methyl para to the original substituent would have less steric factors. So choosing out of the two, the para should be the more favored product. And if, again, we only have one answer to pick, that would be the more likely answer. But we would get some product with the methyl being ortho as well. So notice this is how we pull all of this information together to answer questions quickly on an orgo exam. So now that we've talked about all the substituents, here are the key points for all of them. Member one, a substituent on a benzene ring affects both the reactivity, makes it more or less reactive, and the orientation, meaning where other electrophiles will add on the ring, either orthopara directing or meta directing. We also saw that number two, some substituents make benzene more reactive. Those are called electron donating groups. And some make it less reactive, electron withdrawing groups. And remember, we also know that certain substituents fit in certain groups. And there's only three groups, orthopair directing activators, orthopair directing deactivators, and meta directing deactivators. And we should memorize all the substituents in those groups before our next orgo exam. And we should also have a method of analyzing substituents that may not be on our list. And again, that other online lecture, please make sure you watch it so you can evaluate any substituent that's in front of you on an orgo exam.